brilliant and busy minds that have joined us this morning. And so as we hop into a meeting, we always uh, are, are, are shifting our brains to the new thing that's in front of us. And we want to support you by giving you a few minutes to review what really is the table of contents, sort of the meat of this playbook. We're going to put just one page of the playbook in the chat right now. And it really gives us a beautiful overview of what Jess and I are going to talk about today. So we're going to just pause for a minute. If you have water or coffee, drink it, notice your breath. Open that playbook page right now, page seven. And just glance through all these amazing ideas that we're going to be talking about with you today. Page seven, open it up in the chat and just relax. I'll be back. Give yourself about two minutes, drink, breathe, and look at this playbook. And Jess and I will get a great conversation started. that page, that you are seeing all kinds of connections, all kinds of ways that you uh, can imagine the good work in Wisconsin. So Jess, you and I are going to get started and have a, couple, a nice conversation here, like a couple of colleagues, just wondering about this amazing work that's been done at the national level. So as, as I look at this playbook and we had page seven in front of us for a minute, how, what was the purpose of it? Like, how did you get this thing started? Why did you do it? Hi, all. Can you hear me? Okay, wonderful. Just as a clarity, I have the meeting also connected on my phone. I have my computer right here, but I'm also hearing the iterations of, of the conversation here. So just in case if my Wi-Fi goes anywhere funky, let me know and I'll just hop on my mobile device and we'll just get a, a different, maybe better angle. Um, but hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me this morning. I am so excited uh, to join Wisconsin. Just for uh, a quick disclaimer, I love Wisconsin's programs for children across the board. I saw somebody from UCF here. I think Wisconsin is leading uh, not just in youth mental health, but in child care. Uh, child welfare, things like that. So I, I am super excited to, to hop on today and talk a little bit about the governor's the governor's playbook. Um, so the purpose of this conversation is twofold. Uh, I say why the playbook and why NGA. Um, so I'll start with why the playbook. So this was driven by Governor Phil Murphy from New Jersey. Uh, and this was his 2023, 2022-2023 uh, chairs initiative. Um, and this was spurred a little bit by not just tragic incidents they'd seen in New Jersey. I'm sure you all know the kind of um, when youth mental health programs fail and it's, you know, results in these horrific tragedies and everybody's looking around saying, what could we have done? How could we have done this? Not just at an individual level, but also at a systems level. And he had seen that across, you know, his state and, and his jurisdiction, but then was also looking at the national statistics and was incredibly concerned. I mean, we've seen across the youth behavioral risk survey, social vulnerability, the staggering rise in, in suicides, um, especially among uh, youth of color, LGBTQ youth, all of those concerns. I mean, as a parent, he is a parent of four children. Um, he just felt like he had to do something. And so the, the playbook was created with the goal of engaging governors specifically. Um, we really wanted to take a, a perspective of the governor's view because we know that governors in this space have a huge amount of influence that sometimes isn't as clear to them. Imagine you're a new governor walking into administration, somebody's talking to, to you about energy, somebody's talking to you about grid resilience, and then you have to understand all of youth mental health. 
Um, and so we wanted to create a document from the NGA perspective that served our audience, which is governors um, and the and the people and the branches that they serve. And so we also wanted to create a document that not only highlighted the power of the executive, but approached it from the lens of, of the and. And I say that is this example of what I just provided of when you're a governor, you have to think about energy and infrastructure and education and youth mental health. And then within youth mental health, you have to think about child welfare and juvenile justice and K-12 education and higher ed institutes and child care. And so we recognized that within the field, there wasn't necessarily a document that was easily accessible, not you know, a dense research paper or a thesis that just provided and addressed this and, and this and philosophy that governors have to deal with. And so we created the playbook to serve as a jumping off point uh, of a library of options across state silos, across um, pillars, as I, I'll talk about in a minute, and across um, the age of a child. And the, the goal of the playbook is, is not to be the most robust document you've ever seen. If you were to dig into any of these individual opportunities or priorities, you would find deep work done by people on the ground that add nuance and character and depth to these programs. We just wanted to create a start, a starting point, you know, some sort of tool book that, you know, first day on the job, you could open up and say, okay, what can I do in this space? And certain states, you know, this might be They'll read through, you know, I'm sure as, as Wisconsin, Wisconsinite, you might read through, you might be like, okay, we're doing one, two, and three. But even then, if you find an example in four that you're not doing, that you're inspired by, that's a win for us. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's, that's exactly the jumping off point that I saw on page seven. I mean, I was like, I, that's exactly where my brain was like, oh, we're doing that. We could be doing better here. Like all of that. So so you, you organize the work in four pillars with very specific examples. You want to say a little bit about more, you know, sort of that aspect of it. Yeah, absolutely. So when we were designing the playbook, we were trying to come up with a, a framework that helped us, again, approach that. And that we know that a lot of youth mental health, you can talk about prevention. You can't talk about stigma reduction, um, treatment, et cetera, family and community support. Um and we realized that a lot of the, the materials that were out there approached those as maybe um, separate spaces, but we wanted to see it as like the continuum of life of a, of a child. Um, and at the same time, if you're interested in this, as I'm sure many Wisconsinites are, we were running a, a first ladies initiative with uh, first lady Tammy Murphy on maternal infant health. And so we kind of had this very holistic view among the NGA team of just the whole child wellness across the continuum from infancy to late adult adolescence, 27, 28, all the way up. Um, and so when we uh, were developing the policy pillars, we tried to bucket topics uh, in a way that would be understandable. It was a, it was definitely a challenge. I will say, and, and I'm sure all of you know this, that once you start untang yes. untangling the knots of youth mental health, um, you can go in a million different directions. It's kind of like a necklace. It's like mm -hmm. the knot um, that keeps pr cr producing more knots. Um, so the four pillars that we chose to bucket systems into are prevention and resilience. Um, and so that includes uh, upstream uh, delivery of, of social drivers of, of health, uh, well-being and things like that, ACEs prevention, um, family intervention, uh, infant and early childhood mental health can oftentimes fit in here, although it's also can be a delivery method uh, and treatment. And then we also focused on reducing stigma and increasing awareness. Um, and so that was broken down between not just uh, reducing stigma universally, which this generation is definitely a lot better uh, about it better? doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, just so open, um, but also increasing awareness among the community because we often found, and this relates to the fourth pillar as well, just like awareness of youth mental health signs and symptoms of just what did it look like for a youth to have to be suffering from depression? What does it look like for a youth to be ex expressing symptoms of anxiety? And just raising the awareness of what, not just that they exist, but turning it into, and you're, you're a player in this space and, and you can do mm -hmm. something about this. Um, we also did uh, access to treatment and care, which was, I will say, our biggest pillar in terms of content. If you're flipping through the playbook, you're going to see a whole lot of information on it because it encompasses everything from workforce to telehealth to licensing to parity to, you know, improving clinical delivery and things like that. And I don't think we even touched on defining quality care, which I'm sure um, many folks 
here also have an expertise in. Um, and so that was kind of our pull all bucket for all of these, all of these pieces of, of the delivery of service and care. And then the final bucket, which I think is a space that we are really excited to explore in the future is family and community support. Um, the direct line between parental mental health and youth mental health is really, uh, influential. And we also know that uh, in terms of, you know, families, schools, and community uh, organizations, people are really burned out. Um, you look at the educator turnover, uh, the educator workforce, and that can be a big part of hesitation to embed youth mental health programs in schools. And so we wanted to identify services that allowed for uh, that spoke to the, the importance of building a village. And that's how I kind of conceptualized it is that this old idea of like, it takes a village, but the village also has needs. Um, and so the, the final pillar really focuses on how states can embed programs or support organizations that are serving families as a unit and, and, and meeting the needs of, of family, you know, family members and caregivers as well. So just four village, things. I know. Well, and I love the village has needs. I, I, I've not heard it quite said that way before. And I did notice caregiver capacity, noticing their stress, the professionals' capacities, the ways that we need to be taken care of to show up for kids are in the playbook. And so you probably, as you were putting this together, noticed some trends, some patterns, some things that you were noticing, like, oh, I'm seeing this across state. What did you notice? Yeah. So it was the the big standouts for me is that this is kind of top line, a very bipartisan issue every single governor is working on this every single governor you know and i was just actually in milwaukee last month for a meeting um and it was with you know education advisors and, and health and human services advisors and i can't tell you how many times you just hear youth mental health mentioned throughout the entire thing and i think that not only it's across party lines but it's across system lines you could get four representatives from four different agencies in this space and they all identify youth mental health as a priority everyone is feeling this. And so I think that there's, it's, you know, alarming in that way of like, oh, this is a national issue, but there's also a unification there. And like, there is this moment of momentum. And I think that's why Governor Evers declaration of 2023 being the year of youth mental health or mental health in general is just so timely because it really does represent what's happening uh, in the field across state lines here. Um, things that I saw in terms of big trends is that there was there is an expanding philosophy around youth mental health prevention and the integration of youth mental health into like larger <laughs> human services programs, which I think is so influential. Um, and so, you know, when it connects to universal home visiting, you know, mm -hmm. integrating infant and early childhood into, into home visiting programs and supporting that development and drawing down federal dollars to support those programs, we're seeing a lot more in that space. You know, we're seeing states leverage Medicaid. I think it's like 40 something of, of the 50 states draw down Medicaid funding to support screenings of really young children and their families um, through for youth mental health concerns. Um, and then we're also seeing in terms of the interaction of the child welfare system, states leveraging child welfare prevention dollars as well to support children who are at risk of entering the child welfare system because of behavioral health or youth mental health concerns. And that is unbelievable. And we're seeing this across, uh, across party lines. You know, I'm seeing I, the, the examples I'm looking at here, it's like South Carolina, Indiana, and Connecticut all draw down for a program called parent child interaction therapy mm -hmm. and trauma cognitive behavioral therapy, all of these states across the political spectrum and across the geographic spectrum are drawing them down. Um, we're also seeing a big effort in screening. I think that that is a lot of focus in this space. Um, and so I think that there's a, a big push and we're seeing a, a lot of states go after it and in different ways. Some states like Illinois require it in schools. And then some states like Utah are encouraging uh, or, you know, offering an opt-in program. And I think that trend is a really interesting thing to watch if, if you're curious in how the same idea is playing out in different political spaces, states that may have a little bit more of a hesit hesitant environment uh, may look to an opt-in system where a state that has a little bit more of an ambitious uh, agenda around youth mental health and a little bit more kind of unified momentum may require it for schools. Um, and so I think we're seeing that. And I think both of those really uh, 
kind of identify the trend of, of going further upstream and preventing youth mental health tragedies way before uh, they happen. Right, like preventing needless suffering, like investing early, recognizing the integrity of the family before splitting it up, getting, you know, getting, getting authentic services in authentic environments as early as we possibly can, whether it's schools or families or community-based. Um, lovely, lovely to hear that. So that's a trend and that's something, you know, I think we, I know that the people who serve young kids are smiling big in this room right now. So that's wonderful. And there's some pioneering efforts too, that you were like, God, this is unique. I am noticing this. Tell us about that too. Yeah, absolutely. Also, I apologize if you hear my emails coming through. I feel like 1130 is just like a very common time to send emails on a Friday. Um, well, one thing that I do want to call out in Wisconsin that I have been so excited about that Linda actually flagged for me in this kind of like, oh, I think we're the only state to do this. And you are. It's having um, a, an office of children's mental health in the governor's office. I think that is unbelievably influential. I think that if I were to define pioneering efforts, sometimes it's not the most exciting, but it's infrastructure uh, governance uh, choices that are made to prioritize and allow for the prioritization. Because if there's one thing I'm sure people in this room know is that some of the biggest limits to implementing a program is not a lack of research, it's not a lack of passion, it is bureaucracy. And so by making these deliberate choices to prioritize structurally uh, youth mental health, I think that that is something that we're going to see across the board. We've seen this in different spaces where um, where, where states are chewing on something like child care and they're creating different offices, they're moving their offices around because it was recognized as a priority. And I believe that Wisconsin's going to be at the kind of top end of, we'll see a lot more of this as it starts to move out of uh, not just the health and human services space, but into the governor's priorities, right up there with the governor's council on infrastructure, right up there with the governor's council on energy, the, the office of, of children's mental health. Um, I'm also seeing, I'm really excited about initiatives to create wraparound systems of care, um, because we know, don't have to tell anybody in this room, uh, if a, a family or youth is struggling, making them kind of walk the block of, of trying to find services and then connecting all those services, because oftentimes, you know, youth mental health concerns do not occur in a vacuum. They can oftentimes be representative of a family need, of larger services and supports and things like that. And so I, you know, I worked closely with New Jersey, the CSOC system in New Jersey is influential. Uh, and I, and I love that as well, but I was also impressed by an initiative in Indiana to create the children's mental health wraparound centralized point of entry. Um, and so this is within their division of mental health and addiction. And so they have, uh, you know, uh, they've partnered with nonprofit child advocates to administer this program as well. And I think it, it represents not only public private partnership, but public nonprofit partnership to really create a system that, uh, that can kind of catch a child like a baseball and wrap them in this glove and wrap the family in this glove, which I think is really lovely. Um, and I also know, and just help the adults get along. Oh, yes. You know, so I mean, uh, Wraparound provides the opportunity for different providers with family members, Family Voice and Choice Central to actually create a circle of support, but the grownups are sometimes the hard part. And so yeah. when we practice at the at every level, those collaborative, like seeking each other's perspectives, we win. But I think about the table, I, I'm a wraparound hack, Jess. I gotta, I gotta tell you, that's how I grew up. So I think about all the kitchen tables I've sat at where we really figure out what is that glove that you just, the metaphor of the glove holding the child, what does that look like? So I appreciate wraparound being fished out and we've got some great systems of care work going in Wisconsin as well. So other thoughts yeah. that you have, I know you've got a couple other examples and I got to move you to workforce because Matt put a question in there about workforce and I know you got a few things to say. Give me a couple other pioneering yeah. examples. I'll go fast and I'll call them out so you can find them later. Connecting social needs. North Carolina's Healthy Opportunities Pilot using Medicaid dollars. Unbelievable. Have heard it a million times. We'll say it a million more. Driving, you know, driving social wellness. Wisconsin, I think, it, or not Wisconsin, Wyoming. Sorry, I'm looking at my notes here and seeing W states. Connecting funding to initiatives. Grant programs in Wyoming that attach dollars to, you know, kind of mandates that I think is, is a really great thing. They're positive school climate grant. Awesome. 
creating social connectedness. And this is the last one I want uh, to mention because I'll, I'll mention a little bit about the crisis system in a minute. Um, Maryland uh, is uh, a state that requires community service learning experience as a stipulation for graduation and just working with Westmore's team. They very much see that as a tool to, to bolster youth mental health. Um, and then lastly, the crisis system. I think this is one of the biggest spaces that there is room for innovation and support. And that's not only um, drawing down and implementing 98 and con continuing fidelity of that program, but also engaging uh, and expanding youth specific crisis centers, creating and uh, building more robust mobile crisis teams, and then also expanding respite uh, programs. We've seen a lot of flexibilities where states are now allowing for respite programs at summer camps, allowing for respite programs that last longer, you know, and I think that there's, there's really space there for states to do an accounting of their systems and say, how many hours do we give families of crisis support, of respite care, of supports? Where are they? Where are the barriers to accessing that? So those are kind of the, the key themes. A lot of around family support and then also upstream intervention. But let's get to workforce, Monica. This yeah, because, you know, Matt was just asking the question about will there be enough uh, counselors to meet the needs of kids? And I'm hearing yes to respite, which, by the way, is so respectful for families. But let's talk workforce because that's it is an important thing. We're short, as you know. So ideas that are coming through on the playbook on workforce. Yes, I called workforce our bleeder conversation because every time we tried to talk about an initiative, workforce was there. It would just bleed into workforce because it's like you want to run innovative programs in schools. We got two school counselors. Who's going to do it? Um, and, you know, and this is workforce and I'll, I'll highlight two spaces, workforce in the provider space, but then also in the state space. One of the big pieces that I want to call out here is that it is so interesting the impact that state licensing boards can have on workforce development in the youth mental health space. And this is one of the things that I would kind of call out here. We heard from a state that only had one person running the licensing for their state you know, youth mental health providers. That person went on a two week vacation. The lag that that created, unbelievable. And so I think that that's, I think that that's a big call out here as well. Um, workforce, you know, Leveraging, as I mentioned at the top, leveraging traditional workforce development pieces, we've seen a trend around apprenticeships and grow your own programs. And we've seen this a lot when we think about like um, kind of traditional fields, plumbers, welders, carpenters, et cetera. And it's just about uh, like approaching that framework of apprenticeship in youth mental health, of social workers, of psychologists, of psychiatrists. And there are so many things that you can do that allow for those transition of, of pieces. I know Michigan's um, they have a, a student mental health apprenticeship and retention and training. They have a program. They pay their apprentices to do this. Attaching compensation is huge. Georgia does a, a, trans, a transform, tr transformative experiential training grant. Um, and so that grant is focused on getting traditionally excluded populations into these workforce pieces. Um, loan repayment is a big one. Uh, New Jersey allows for providers to have up to $150,000 of, of student loan balance paid off for behavioral health professionals. But what they do is that they incentivize people who work with youth and children as well. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, and one thing that I know Governor Murphy, I don't know if this ever came into legislation, one thought that he had during the roundtables and events was, do we require that though? Like, mm -hmm. do we say you have to go work with youth uh, and children? And what other requirements could we put on loan repayment to really target the strategic use of, of workforce? Could you say you have to serve in a workforce desert space? Um, we also know that there's a big initiative to connect and uh, leverage pediatricians. Um, so, you know, outside of the schools, you know, we, we talk about grow your own and then also the delivery of pieces, um, connecting pediatricians to the support that they have because a general pediatrician may not have youth mental health expertise. And so one example that I love in the playbook is Oklahoma's Project ECHO. Um, and so that's a hub and spoke model that educates local providers about providing pediatric mental health care, especially in underserved areas. And where I think that's really innovative is that I think that there is a bond to be had here because between states that have rural populations, because not only allowing for pediatri uh, pediatricians to support and, you know, consult with experts in youth behavioral health allows them to be another key in the workforce. And again, compensating them for their time and training. Um, and also telehealth. We've seen 
Telehealth is one of those things that came out of the pandemic. And I think we're going to see a big revolution as it comes to, to flexibilities and then assessing telehealth barriers. One of the big themes we heard in the roundtables is that college students, especially you go to college out of state um, and suddenly you don't have access to your therapist. And then telehealth regulations between states can oftentimes also uh, lead to youth who's suffering, having to reintroduce themselves, maybe get into a college, uh, a college behavioral health system, which is usually and often running a long wait list, um, where something like a telehealth compact or a telehealth agreement, or just an assessment of, of accessibility there would allow for better flexibility. So that's my quick synopsis of workforce. As you can tell, there's a ton here and there's a ton in the playbook. And I just encourage everyone to read that section, especially because I think that's where a lot of the meat uh, is here that allows us to deliver some of the innovative services. Agreed, agreed, agreed. Linda, jump in with us now and let's make some connections to uh, our work here at OCMH. Yeah, thanks. So this is really exciting. I've spent quite a bit of time with, with the playbook, but I'm still learning more from Jessica. So it's great to have you here um, guiding us through it. Um, you know, I, I, I see that we have made some progress in many areas, but there's still much more we can do. I identified four areas that I thought um, I saw examples from other states that I thought we are places where we could really dig in some more. And um, that's in terms of uh, screening, that there are states funding screening so that schools don't have to pay for it. They, it's just, it, you know, it's there, it's sustainable. We don't have to, schools don't have to come up with the dollars. So I think that's important. Did you wanna say something to that, Jessica? No, okay. And then mobile crisis, which you pointed out, I think that's an area we have um, had some innovative things in mobile crisis, but I, I don't think we have nearly as much as we need. And um, we, you know, there in, we have some initiatives now around crisis stabilization centers, but my gosh, it's going so slowly. Um, and we need those places now. You know, we don't we don't need them when kids are ten years older than they are now. Um, I you you identified family engagement, and I see some um, real substantial funding of family engagement strategies in other states that we haven't done. I think our office, I think, does a great job in terms of bringing in people with lived experience. We have through partnerships with the Department of Children and Families um, and the Department of Public Instruction, we've been able to bring more um, parent voices to the table. But um, and there, there's more we can do. Although everybody should take a look at the new thing that's, that's coming out, which is the Wisconsin Wayfinder, which is uh, a new um, uh, tool that the Department of Health Services just announced yesterday that helps people figure out how to get services for the kids. And then the fourth thing I was going to say is um, I see some real efforts around uh, for educators around mental health days and um, support for their mental health and self-care. And since I, I see right now in the, you know, with the mental health profession shortage that we have, that we are relying on our educators a lot. And um, they have had a tough time during the pandemic. They're having a tough time with kids who are coming back and still needing more support since the pandemic. And we could do a better job taking care of them. And then they can also be modeling um, what we want kids to do, which is to, you know, care for their their wellness. Amy Marsman, our uh, senior research analyst, is always reminding us that, you know, it's like we got to care for our brain like we care for the rest of our body, you know, and we have to learn how to do that. Those are the things I wanted to offer. Yeah, you know, uh, thank you, Linda. I think that uh noticing where we can learn from other states that are featuring uh, promising practices. I also know, Jess, you had a couple of ideas about kind of low uh, low impact, high reward. I mean, low cost, high reward um, uh, that you might want to mention too. So let's, let's dive into that a little bit before we let our group really chew on this thing and make connections about what's happening in our state. Yeah, and I just want to reiterate all that uh, Linda was just sharing. I was just like full endorsement of everything there. I think that there's uh, 
there's a lot of work happening in Wisconsin that I'm super excited to see. I will definitely touch ba- touch back with you guys after this meeting to, to see how those pieces are running. Um, so one of the one of the things that I do want to call out explicitly in the development of this playbook, I talked to like 55 organizations that are working in this space. And I asked them the question, if you had $10 to put into youth mental health, where would you put it? Everyone, well, not everyone, a lot of the big voices says suicide prevention plan. That was one of the big pieces that they called out, especially the Trevor Project pointed out a statistic that even when a state or a school just has the plan, they see a reduction in in suicide, uh, suicide attempts, Um, completions, tragedies, et cetera. I think that that's a really interesting space and finding a statewide plan to prevent suicide and finding different modalities to deliver that plan, you know, schools and faith-based organizations and out of school supports, um, I think is, is really one of those spaces where it doesn't necessarily cost a ton of money to develop a plan, but it could have a really, really huge impact in a state. Um, And then I also think, you know, licensing and compacts, as I mentioned above, is, is really helpful. And I do just want to call out that I think part of what uh, is makes it influential Governor Evers is that setting a priority and like even just saying aloud the, the governor's priorities and their I- ideas is something that is free, that does have a huge influence on the in energy and the ambitiousness and the kind of attitude around youth mental health. We saw it in Ohio, Governor uh, DeWine said, like went to his staff and said, be ambitious about children. And it energized the departments. And so I think oftentimes, even just saying the kind of basic stuff out loud can have a huge impact in the morale, the energy, and then also the the kind of aggressiveness, it's a lack of a better word, of which people approach these programs. Yeah, we're really fortunate to have Governor Evers leading on this for us. But I I wanted to follow up on your statement on suicide prevention. Um, Wisconsin, I believe, does not do as much in terms of uh, requiring suicide prevention as some states do. And and, um, I think that the states who actually have these requirements for suicide prevention plans are having uh, better statistics than we are. But we're excited that we are going to be bringing to our youth leaders um, early next year we're gonna be doing a training with them on a, alternatives to suicide, which is a new approach to talking about um, how to talk with for peers to talk to uh, you know their peers about those issues. And I also wanted, you brought up um, a number of things in terms of workforce. You know, we have some efforts going on in those areas. We don't have the kind of support we need from the legislature to get some things in place. For example, um, we don't have um, as good mental health parity in the state as we could have, but we have a legislature that will not, um, you know, put any kind of mandates on insurance companies. And we have, we we do have some legislation right now that would relate to that telehealth issue that you uh, brought up so that that college kids can get some um, coverage when they're out of state. Um, So there's, there's something for us to work on there. But we also need, we need more bodies in the Department of um, Safety and Professional Services to actually do the applications. And we need to have, we need to be able to recognize um, what other states, when people are licensed and in good standing in other states, we need, we need to be able to recognize them immediately in Wisconsin. And mm-hmm. we have so far been unable to break through on that, but that would, that would help our supply of people Um, because we got people waiting in the wings for months to get their license in Wisconsin. So things to work on. Um, I was noticing um, that we have a question from Pernicia. Pernicia, if you want to unmute and ask, you can feel free to do that right now. Um, Good morning, and thank you for allowing me to ask a question here. Um, I've been doing youth mental health programming for 10 years, and in the programming, I always survey the kids to talk about where they are traumatized the most. 76% 76% of the kids I surveyed say that they are traumatized the most in school. And so when we talk about providing mental health resources in the school, we're talking about training them in a space where they're already being traumatized. In my experience, I have found that they are less receptive in school spaces to talk about mental health, to give mental health support, because they're around the same people that are doing A, B, or C. And I just wanted to see what the trend has been across the nation as far as like these kind of outside alternative support type programming for youth because I I just I wouldn't want to learn in the same space that I was being traumatized in. 
And so I'm really working to make sure that my programs are in a safe, kind of calm and easy place outside of a school setting. And I wanted to see if that was a trend too. Also, I've seen a lot of you know schools and teachers say that we can't really prioritize that much of instruction time towards mental health. So they're not really getting a full kind of robust training in mental health or training in protective factors due to the limited amount of time that they have actually in the court curriculum. So I just kind of wanted to see what people were doing with those kinds of statistics and kind of like what the youth are saying they want. Yeah, let yeah. me just say, uh, just real quick, Jess. Uh, so I've worked at the Department of Public Instruction and Pernice, I do want to acknowledge and respect the perspective of schools being causing harm. Um, I, I am not naive to that, nor is any of the staff that we work with, that there are certain, there are children who are not being supported well in schools. And so I appreciate that perspective. And I think embedding mental health supports across our community and authentic environments beyond school, we welcome it, frankly. I mean, we cannot be the only door and we're not the appropriate door sometimes. So having support services in after school programs and community centers in other places that don't have that stigmatizing environment, I 100% uh, want to endorse what you're offering there. And thank you for listening to the kids because they have important things to say. Just weigh in. Oh, yeah. Um, okay, so my, I completely agree. And I think that's actually kind of why we approach this and piece, because we understand that like oftentimes schools, especially K-12, is viewed as the primary service modality for this space. But we also know drawing down Medicaid, wildly complicated for this issue. It Billing is impossible. And we also recognize that students themselves will come to you and say, hey, listen, I don't necessarily need this for my teachers. I need this for my friends. Engaging the peer workforce, supporting peer voice, youth mental health first aid, huge theme in sports teams, um, I think is huge and is a really great way to um, to and sports coaches, there's a, a bunch of really great organizations that are doing work in the sports, sports coaching space, boys and girls clubs. And I loved, I was actually on Wisconsin's website, the integration with libraries and other community voices. I think that is huge. I think that is, you know, a, a, a massive piece. We've also seen a big push to uh, involve faith-based communities as well. You know, places that maybe traditionally might, you know, working with government, it's a little bit of an interesting space, but because of, you know, this idea of catching youth who are falling through the cracks, who are maybe don't have a great relationship with their schools, et cetera, um, I think is really critical. I also think this is a great opportunity to power, uh, to leverage the power of creators in your space, identifying local influencers that are driving change that children are listening to in, uh, in your state, I think is a really, it's, it, it's a power to that testimony of, of directing them to resources. So I, I completely understand. I do think that this is something that every governor is thinking about. You know, no, nobody's kind of looking at this as just schools, but I do agree that sometimes schools feels like the, the best inroad because we think about it the best touch point, but the data is showing us that we need to be more creative about thinking about that schools and philosophy. Schooled and and he started that way that it's it's a village it's and it's not just the therapists it's not just the docs it's not just the teachers it's a it's a collective approach that pays attention not only to mental health but also basic needs I mean there I thought there were some really creative things about flexible funding for things like housing and other things that disrupt a family's well being that we like well let me help out that seven year old when the whole family is spinning is just doesn't make any darn sense so. I did appreciate that. You also called out the peer workforce um, in the chat, Jess, and I, I really appreciate that. I think they have such an important like liminal space between the systems that advocacy voice is so powerful. Do you want to say a few more things about peers? Yes, I do. Before I do that, I do have to call out one specific uh, person in Wisconsin that I know. Lauren Wawange is the District 2 Milwaukee Commissioner on the Youth Advisory Council. I had her speak at our meeting in Wisconsin. I just saw her in DC this past week, also speaking on a youth uh, mental health panel. So I am happy to connect all of you with her. If you have not met her, she is a commissioner and she's phenomenal. And I like would regret it if I didn't mention her name in this room uh, and Thank called you. her out. Um, and yes, the peer workforce is, is key. They bring lived experience, lived expertise, and they often are trusted messengers. Nothing gets a message across. Like I've been where you are and here's how I 
solved it and there is a path forward. And we're seeing a lot of states not just like consider this as a workforce opportunity, but formalize it, developing standards, creating compensation structures, creating market plans. I know the New, New Hampshire Governor Sununu has tied it in with opioid okay. response the and, and addiction prevention part of it was as not well. Just talking. Um, and so there's there's a lot of there's a lot of space there. Um, and I think it's not just, you know, gaining ground in the idea of using the peers as workforce, but then also creating those formalized workforce structures. Mm -hmm. The pathways to legitimate compensation, good training, good support, 100%. Other questions from the brilliant people in the room here. We've got another, you know, a few minutes here for people to raise questions in the chat. You can raise your hand. Somebody will help me out here. We are happy to put your voices in the room so on a collective a conversation like this one. We do have a question from Kimberly. November is Family Court Improvement Awareness Month. Is the NGA looking at the national conversation about improving family court? If not, she provides a link to how New York is making legislative change to improve family court. So any, any comments, anything you heard, Jess, um, in, your, in your sessions and discussions on the whole family court thing? Yeah, absolutely. I think family court is, is key. The one thing with our space is because the executive and the judicial branch are separated in states that the governor doesn't necessarily have influence over the, how the courts run, rather the appointee process of, of nominating judges. But I do think that's a space we're very interested in. It overlaps with a ton of child welfare and well-being priorities, especially youth mental health. So I will be looking at that New York resource afterward. Thank you for flagging me for that. I, uh, I sometimes miss which months are which. To me, November is also Thanksgiving month, so I'm already thinking about turkey and stuffing. And just one follow-up yeah. question. Um, the free care, um, I know that I've been a huge advocate of getting that Wisconsin uh, state plan adjustment made, um, the Free Care Act. Um, do you have any insight as to if this a lot more states are taking care of this or, or getting involved with this and, and what actions has it been hard for states to do this? And um, it, it just your two cent, two minutes of insight would be appreciated because we are having conversations in Wisconsin about this, but I, you know, more fire behind it would be amazing. Yeah, I think um, really, I will definitely connect you with folks that are actually doing the work on this space yeah. after this as well. I don't, I don't know if you've connected to the Kennedy Forum yet, but they're driving some yeah. great work on that, on that rule. Um, I am not an expert in the legislation, but I do know that in terms of challenges a lot of states have approached uh, because of the strong relationships they have with uh, insurance providers in the state. Uh, oftentimes, again, using businesses, uh, this is a, you know, kind of workforceizing it, but using businesses as local voice uh, to push and, and consumers of healthcare to push, uh, you know, private companies, insurance companies to come to the table. Um, and I know a lot of states have taken this up as well. And I can't remember, um, exactly who has done some stuff i remember seeing it but it got lost in the in the weight of of other spaces so i don't have a full answer for you now but i'm happy to follow up after this call and find out uh, a little bit more about what states are doing around the free care rule and i i have another question too to put forward to you jess um so wisconsin is really moving for uh, infant and early childhood men mental health consultation and I'm wondering if you saw any trending um, in along those lines in all of your research and conversations. Yes, I love IUCMH, IUCMH consultation. It is phenomenal. And I could not recommend, I will have everybody write down this name. His name is Dr. Walter Gilliam. He's out of North Carolina, I believe. He is an expert that we are happy to connect you and your team with afterward. He, he, who runs these specializations. I think what's interesting here too is um, connecting IECMH uh, consultations and funding with other funding streams that serve early intervention. I think that's a really big opportunity is that there's a ton of funding available that you can be creative with. Uh, like IDEA Part C, you can leverage. Uh, Medicaid, you can leverage. Early intervention funding, things like that. And so it's a lot about grading these, these funds to create these systems. But they drive a, a ton of innovation. And also uh, there's a conversation around uh, supporting childcare staff as well, because youth mental health exists all the way in the, you know, the zero to five space. 
and behavioral health outbursts in childcare centers were driving a, a lot of burnout among those staff. And so leveraging childcare consultants, not just as a tool to support child well-being, but to support staff well-being and take some of this, the pressure off of staff to be the behavioral health providers in that space as well. So I'm happy to connect afterwards with Dr. Walter Gilliam, um, Sheila Smith from the National Center in Children in Poverty, also driving voices on this issue. Mm -hmm. When I'm just noticing from Monique and others, the appreciation on focusing on food, housing, economic security, those kinds of things. And in Wisconsin, we're dealing not only with the child care providers needing that behavioral health support, but we have deserts. Talk about a way to have a family be spinning very quickly. It's with expensive child care costs or no access when you need to go to work. So I have to, my friend in early childhood would be grateful that we named the desert as a priority. And, and we've been working hard and running into bumps on this one. Um, here in our state, for sure. Um, other questions or thoughts are welcome. We're going to just take a few mm -hmm. more minutes. Um, there's just been so much. Um, yeah, well, there's a summary of the names and contests can be shared. We definitely uh, are recording this and we'll we'll get right to it. Um, so I did get a question um, yeah, please. and I'm going to try to um, uh, phrase it <laughs> appropriately. Um, we do see a lot of funding going towards schools for uh, school-based mental health. Are, did you see any other models that maybe were uh, directing funding directly to mental health providers? You should talk to New Jersey. They had a system uh, where they just recently did it and against, um, they got a lot of flack for it, which is justified and things like that. But the governor and the, the, um, the state looked at budget numbers and said, how much And, you know, if we were to take an efficiency mindset, where could we use things more strategically while still supporting? So it's the New Jersey, it's the C4S or something like that. I believe it's the program in New Jersey, CJ4S or something like that. Um, oh, no, right at the important part. I will put it in the chat. Um, I think that that is a really great model of how states are considering you know, not reappropriating because we don't want to reappropriate. We don't want to take money away from schools and, and, and those services, but also expanding that uh, to also support community hubs and community providers and, and, and organizations that are also embedded in the community, but not schools themselves. So New Jersey would be the space. It's not in the playbook because it was so new when we wrote it, but I'll find the name of the program right now and put it in the chat. Well, and as, as a school mental health professional, I am eager to have community solutions stand right alongside school mental health is kind of sexy right now you know how it is we love a nice shiny penny and we're running toward it and i think legitimately so but we cannot be the only pathway to support for all the good reasons that have come up today so our community i've worked in nonprofits, and they need as much attention a love finance resources are offering um, um operating in under resourced ways um, and, and Kelly uh, Key Michael is sharing about our systems of care commitment uh, here in Wisconsin as well, with a focus on philosophy, infrastructure, and the array of services. We've got a lot of cross systems work happening, looking at uh, the development of our children's system of care with a real attention to local solutions. What can happen locally to care? The kids who are closest to the kids, right? The adults. That's where the juice is, and how can the state empower local communities to do their system of care better? I love being a part of that work. It's very, very exciting. Okay, you got Monica? the. Go ahead. Hey, I have a question for Jess. Please. So, um, what what are you seeing as innovative in terms of getting uh, in, increased in, in uh, integration between pediatrics and mental health? So we, we've got a lot of interest in that. We've got some folks trying to work on it. Always seems like pediatricians are too busy and um, to pay much attention to this and are, con and are uh, cautious about getting involved in mental health. Did, have you seen some things you think are worth us looking at? Yeah, I would say I would go back to um, Project Echo specifically. That's what I mentioned from Oklahoma. I know it's in the, um, it's in the playbook and around it is also other examples. I think I hate, you know, I feel like everybody in government says hub and spoke, hub and spoke, hub, hub and spoke for literally every answer. Um, but I'm seeing a, a big piece in that support. Um, and I think what uh, Oklahoma is doing that's interesting is that it's 
it allows access to kind of, you know, mental health consultants as well. So instead of, you know, there's, you can take two pathways. You have training for, for pediatricians. And I know a number of states are pursuing of, of making sure that pediatricians have awareness of mental health signs and symptoms and can deliver some care. But there's also the philosophy of outsourcing that expertise. And I think what Project Echo does is it allows um, states to fund, uh, you know, a psychiatrist, uh, an advanced kind of team in one space that provides tele telehealth and tele support to pediatricians. And I think that's a big piece because it helps c- combat that kind of, you know, hesitancy, which is fair for pediatricians. I mean, there's a pediatrician and primary care shortage. Um, so they're already, they're already burned out. And so I think having a, a teammate or uh, an expert or kind of an overseer not only helps lift the workforce burden, but also that pressure of like, I'm new in this. What if I mess up? You know, what if I accidentally refer a child to a treatment that doesn't work? Everybody's very nervous because of the stakes of these, these situations. Um, And I think that I would recommend those hub and spoke models as well. Well, and uh, Rebecca brings to us the, uh, a reminder of the Wisconsin Child Psychiatric Consultation Program, which we have been very supportive of in this space, which does give support to pediatrician from psychiatrists on mental health care for, for, young, for young people. So I need to wrap up this section. I, I hope you were buckled in, friends, because we covered a lot of ground. So I'm going to pass it back to Karen, where we